The amazing Cassini spacecraft and its sibling lander Huygens have now concluded their scientific studies, bringing back years of data to be combed through by scientists, plotting their next journey to Saturn's space. Now it's time for other planets and other spacecraft to shine. Juno piercing the cloak of Jupiter and her distant relative New Horizons at the edge of the solar system. After 20 years, the Cassini project finally comes to an end in dramatic style. But with one door closing, another opens. Now the enviable task of having to unravel the data Saturn has just laid bare begins. And they have literally just scratched the surface. I think Cassini has left us with humankind's presence at another planet for 13 years, seeing things that we had never imagined seeing, and at the same time, sharing that with the entire world and opening up vistas for the next sets of missions. One of the issues facing scientists when looking at exploring the new frontier is leaving it in a better state than they found it. So eliminating the problems of space junk or the introduction of alien microbes is paramount in their decision making. But it also helps us satisfy a planetary protection requirement. We're protecting the tiny moon Enceladus as well as Titan. Both of those have global oceans underneath their icy crusts. And just in case there might be life in those oceans, we don't want Cassini to crash into one of those moons once we're out of fuel. While the main focus of the Cassini mission was to delve into the mysteries of Saturn and its rings, the moons of Saturn proved most science-worthy. And Saturn has many moons. In fact, 62 with confirmed orbits. Several are only 50 kilometers in diameter, the largest being Titan, which is bigger than Mercury. The Huygens module that traveled aboard Cassini also became the first probe to land on a moon other than our own and transmit data back to Earth. The temperature at the surface of Titan is about minus 180 degrees, so it's very cold. The landscapes of Titan look a lot like those we have on Earth. We have rivers, lakes, seas, almost oceans of methane. It rains, it rains methane or a mix of ethane and methane. So there are lots of meteorological phenomena or geophysical phenomena on Titan that makes you think of what happens on Earth. But the ingredients are quite different. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. But it is Saturn's sixth largest moon that excited many scientists. As it is virtually covered by clean ice, and ejected plumes of water into space. My favorite moon is Enceladus. And the reason I'm partial to Enceladus is it's the moon that my team discovered a 
water vapor plume at. But not only is there liquid water underneath the surface, but there's organic material, there's a heat source. You know, when, when people get excited about the potential for life elsewhere in the solar system, there are four things that you need. You need a heat source, you need liquid water, you need organic material, and you need those three things to be stable over some period of time so that life could potentially form. At Enceladus, we've got three. We're not sure about the stability over time yet. And so based on the Cassini observations we made back in 2005, we've had lots and lots more flybys of Enceladus. We now understand it much better. We understand what organic material is there. I mean, one of the instruments, the ion neutral mass spectrometer, in a very close flyby through the plume, found some ammonia in the plume. First of all, we see plumes. Then we start finding out from the gravity measurements and the imaging that there's a ocean and that it's global. And then there was some measurements by the cosmic dust analyzer that suggested there, were hot, there was hot water being circulated through the rock, the silicon dioxide nanoparticles. This is just the final step that shows that there's molecular hydrogen being produced by these same hydrothermal processes, and that molecular hydrogen has the chemical energy to support microbial systems in the interior ocean. It's really the longevity of the Cassini mission that has allowed us to put together the pieces of the puzzle to really understand a moon like Enceladus. And even this late in the mission, we continue to look at our data to better understand this ocean world. Collating data is one thing, but interpreting and providing vision for future missions is another. This is an area for which the Cassini project came up trumps, because it not only brought together three agencies, it provided the ground for future scientists to develop skills that will provide the basis for new projects. The number of PhDs we've put through the system that are going to be the educators of the next generations. Uh, we've put out 3,000 plus peer-reviewed papers, hundreds of PhDs, thousands of, PhD, of uh, peer-reviewed papers. The legacy, the scientific legacy is huge. The engineering legacy, uh, you know, of using every ounce of engineering capability to uh, exploit a system, I think is again, we, we, we will be built upon. And I, and I can't ignore the international cooperation. I mean, this, we had 19 nations contributing hardware to this mission. We've got over 26 nations now contributing scientifically. The mighty Jupiter is the current target under the microscope with the Juno mission in full swing. The story of our solar system is linked to Jupiter, as it is believed that it was the first planet formed. So if we can understand how, we can begin to unravel the origins of our solar system, and thus, how the Earth came about. Juno must work in a very harsh environment to tease out the answers from the gas giant. When you go to a place as hazardous as Jupiter, we put a lot of time through the whole development process and trying to design a spacecraft that will operate in the high radiation fields, the magnetic environment, the spacecraft charging environment, everything that you do with the Jupiter. And I have to say the spacecraft has been performing admirably. Jupiter's radiation belts pose one of the biggest problems faced by Juno scientists. They exist within the enormous magnetic field that surrounds Jupiter its magnetosphere trapping and accelerating particles. It produces intense belts of radiation similar to Earth's Van Allen belts, but thousands of times stronger. Juno just flew by Jupiter for the first time with all the science instruments on, and it was spectacular. Um, the spacecraft performed flawlessly, the instruments all worked exactly as planned, and the data is amazing. Um, we're looking deep into Jupiter, we're learning about the secrets that it's holding, um, but we're also getting a lot of surprises about the aurora, about the atmosphere, how it works. I mean, just it's, it's just incredible. 
The flybys which followed showed that the massive amounts of energy swirling over Jupiter's polar regions were creating the giant planet's powerful auroras, but not in ways the researchers expected. What puzzled the researchers was the fact that despite the magnitude of these potentials at Jupiter, they are observed only sometimes and are not the source of the most intense auroras as they are on Earth. Juno had its camera, Juno cam, on during the flyby. We got the first pictures of Jupiter's poles, the North and South Pole. They were amazing, a lot of surprises in them. It didn't look like we thought. It doesn't look much like Saturn's pole. Jupiter's poles are covered in these cyclones and anti-cyclone storms, some of them half the size of the Earth or bigger. And we're puzzled as to how they could be formed and stable in that configuration. And the North Pole doesn't look like the South Pole. And so we're questioning, the scientists are really questioning whether this is a dynamic system and are we seeing just one stage and over the next year we're going to watch it disappear? Or is this a stable configuration and that these storms are circulating around each other? While the polar activity appears unique to our solar system, the engineers are looking below its shell for answers. The new science results from Juno really are our first look at close up at how Jupiter works. And so the first time we're looking inside of Jupiter with the into the interior, and what we're seeing is that it doesn't work at all like we had predicted. Almost every model that has the interior motion, how the magnetic field, the gravity field, how the deep atmosphere works, it's all different. Like most scientific undertakings, they result in more questions being asked than answered. So Juno's original uh, objectives really were to understand how Jupiter formed and that would help us understand how planets general form and how the whole solar system was made. What we're finding is is that actually we didn't understand giant planet dynamics very well, the whole atmosphere or interior structure. What we've seen so far is exciting, no question about that. But it's like a puzzle and we're putting the pieces of the puzzle together and it's exciting but we don't have the whole picture yet. And one of those puzzles is the so-called Great Red Spot. And while its presence in a turbulent gases planet is not unusual, the scale is. The Red Spot covers an area twice as large as Earth. And we're gonna go right over the Great Red Spot. And that's really gonna be the first time that we get a close look at that and to see what it's like underneath the top surface layer. I mean, how deep are the roots to that? That's a 300-year-old storm. A lot of scientists believe that the roots must be very deep. Well, when we go over with our microwave radiometer, we're gonna see, is it the same as the zones and belts or is it very different? And nobody really knows. But it's not just Jupiter's poles that hold the greatest interest for the Juno investigators. They are also intrigued by the weather pattern that is unique to this planet, yet familiar in other ways. Studying the atmospheric dynamics helps understand other planets' atmospheres. So when we look at Jupiter, we see a lot of structure that looks very similar to the Earth. We can see storms, we see cyclones, we see anti-cyclones, and these sort of storms and weather systems that we see on Earth are very similar and they're happening on Jupiter. Fluid mechanics is hopefully the same everywhere in the universe, but Jupiter and Earth are very different. Jupiter is much bigger, it rotates a lot faster, they're made of different material, and Jupiter is much further away from the Sun than the Earth is. The quasi-biennial oscillation, or the QBO, on Earth is an equatorial phenomenon in the stratosphere where the winds are changing direction approximately every two years. 
Depending on which phase the QBO is in, eastward or westward, the temperature signal corresponds to that. So it's warmer in the eastward phase and cooler in the westward phase. It's been shown that it can actually be a barrier to transport of aerosols across the equator and has been linked to the frequency and the formation of hurricanes in the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. The long-term scales on Earth's climate is something that we're very interested in and how that applies to other planets' atmospheres is really why we're studying Earth and Jupiter. The quasi-quadrennial oscillation of Jupiter's stratosphere is a temperature signal that we see in the equator where we see the temperature get warmer and cooler approximately every four Earth years. We used a general circulation model where we focused on simulating the effects of small-scale waves produced from convection in Jupiter's equatorial region to simulate the QQO. The waves propagate upwards from the clouds and force the winds in the stratosphere to change direction, going from eastward to westward approximately every four years. Our model is able to reproduce the behavior of the QQO, but was also able to reproduce temperatures from the observations. And both of those together give us a lot of confidence that our model is very accurate in what's driving the QQO. The outer planets serve as a laboratory for understanding atmospheric physics under very different conditions that are present on the Earth. Understanding how their atmospheres change and evolve and their climates can give us insight into any planetary atmosphere. Juno has studied the planet with a suite of tools, revealing much that was previously hidden to the human eye. We have a, an infrared instrument on Juno um, called Juram, and it was uh, designed and built and uh, delivered by the Italian Space Agency. And this instrument makes thermal maps of Jupiter. So the images are showing you what's warm, hot, cold on Jupiter. And one of the things you can see right away is the center of some of these hurricane-like storms are cooler than the surrounding area. And sometimes you go over a warm spot. And we went over one that was very small that seems hotter than the surrounding area. And that's very similar to what Galileo Probe went into back in 1995. The Juno mission is unique because it's the first time that we've ever gone in a polar orbit, which goes from pole to pole, over the North Pole, through periapsis, and uh, under the South Pole. Uh, all the other missions we've done and all the observations we made from Earth were made from the equator. And you don't see the poles very well if you're sitting on the equator. Yes, this is the first time we get the first clear, unobstructed view of what the aurora looks like and what the polar phenomena looks like. And at the same time, we're flying through the magnetosphere right above the aurora so we can sample in situ the charged particles that are precipitating down magnetic field lines, the guys that are exciting the emissions that we see. Juno, like its sister Cassini, has a use-by date when the craft runs out of maneuvering fuel. This may occur during its 12th orbit at the end of its prime mission. However, NASA may choose to extend the mission if there are sufficient reserves. In that case, the deorbit would occur later, on the 34th orbit, as part of the planetary protection policy of NASA. Its pathfinding mission is leading the way for the one to come, the Europa Clipper, a mission in the design phase to look closely at Europa, the moon with a hidden ocean, and the possible location for life to evolve beyond Earth. of Pluto's atmosphere, possibly a hydrocarbon smog, seen from 200,000 kilometers away by NASA's departing New Horizons spacecraft. A few years ago, the dwarf planet Pluto and its five known moons were just small dots in the outer reaches of our solar system.
One of the important things you should understand about Pluto is the real scale of it compared to the rest of the solar system. So we've come to the beach to really convey that, that scale and distance. So if I draw the sun as a 30 centimeter circle, then we have to walk about 35 steps this way in order to draw the Earth in the same type of scale. So we're walking the equivalent of 150 million kilometers, which we call one astronomical unit. Normally, Pluto orbits at about 40 astronomical units from the Sun, but it's actually quite an elliptical orbit, so it changes between about 30 and 50 astronomical units. But back to the Earth. So the Sun is over there at 30 centimeters, which means that the Earth should be about here, about three millimeters, something like this. If we were to draw Pluto in the same scale, it should be 0.3 millimeters, and it should be one kilometer down the beach. So I'm going to draw it. Now, obviously, I can't draw something that's 0.3 millimeters, so I have to draw Pluto a bit bigger. If this is Pluto, then its largest moon is Charon, which is about half its size. But Pluto has four other moons, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. So there's a lot going on around the Pluto system. It's not just a cold, dead, icy rock. The spacecraft spent 16 months sending its data back to Earth, and scientists and non-scientists alike have been enthralled by what it has revealed. If you go in closer to the surface, you can see this type of really diverse terrain. So you have a very bright region. These are flat plains. We're not entirely sure how they formed yet, but there's a couple of leading theories. There's a huge range of mountains. There's all kinds of different aged surfaces. Some of them have lots of craters. Some of them have very few, which means they're younger. If you look at, in a lot of detail at some of the, the mountainous regions, you can see that actually they're, they're a few kilometers high, but they're made of water ice. I mean, that's on Pluto, it's so cold that water ice is the hardest thing. It's more like rock. And so the stuff that forms the softer material is actually nitrogen ice. Water ice on Earth is close to zero degrees, but on Pluto, it's minus 230 degrees Celsius. And there's a glacier of nitrogen ice called Sputnik Planitia, thought to be under a million years old. This is young by planetary standards, and no one knows yet how it formed or is renewed. One of the really fascinating things is some of the surface coloration you can see in these images actually shows that um, there are these uh, compounds called tholins, which are a combination of, um, of elements, but they're related to uh, prebiotic molecules. So they're, they're kind of relevant to prebiotic chemistry. And I think the fact that they have been able to form on planetary surfaces very far out in the solar system at very cold temperatures uh, really has implications for a lot of places. I mean, if you can imagine for star systems outside our own, where the star may be dim and the planets are quite far away, it's interesting to know that there are molecules that could be involved in supplying, uh, you know, biotic material to, uh, to processes that, you know, may one day lead to life or be involved in life or something like that. Um, that they're actually forming way out in the solar system where no one really expected. Pluto is unlike anything seen before. But the six gigabytes of New Horizons images and scientific measurements are giving scientists mysteries to unravel for years to come. In the meantime, asleep for the moment, the probe travels deeper into the unknown, soon to awaken at its next destination. The Soviet-era Luna 3 was the first spacecraft to use gravity to change course to photograph the dark side of the moon. The NASA Mariner 10 mission used the technique to swing by Venus to target Mercury. The gravity assist or slingshot maneuver has become a standard for navigating the solar system, with our probes reaching further, faster and more accurately than ever before.
The Voyager mission started by chance over 40 years ago, when Michael Minovich, a mathematics PhD student, decided to tackle celestial mechanics' holy grail. It was known as the three-body problem. As it looked at the sun, a planet, and a third object traveling in space, and how gravity from the two objects affected the trajectory of the third. Minovich was eager to take advantage of IBM's latest computer, the 7090. This computer was a second generation transistorized version of the IBM 709, a vacuum tube mainframe which had a processing speed of around 100 kiloflops per second, unthinkably slow by today's standards. The laws of physics and the conservation of momentum demand that the probe approaching the gravitational influence of the planet and accelerating will then decelerate upon leaving that gravitational field with a net speed increase of zero. However, the probe's speed and direction will change in reference to the sun. His solution has become known as gravity assist or slingshot. While undertaking an internship at NASA's JPL, he convinced them to test his model using their data. The results confirmed his predictions that if it flew close enough to a planet, a spacecraft could utilize that planet's motion to accelerate itself away from the sun. When Caltech graduate Gary Flandro was tasked to see if gravity assist could aid deep space missions to the outer planets, he discovered there was to be an alliance of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, an event that occurred only once every 176 years, an opportunity not to be missed. So it was decided to launch a mission in 1977. Two spacecraft would be launched which would slingshot past all four of them, a grand tour of the solar system's outer planets in a 12-year time frame. This was to become known as the Voyager missions, and the rest is history. Ultimately, we're able to put together a picture of where we are in the galaxy and how that environment then influences our environment right here at home. Um, in particular, the radiation environment, which has implications for all sorts of things, including human exploration of space. Today, those two spacecraft have continued on beyond the influence of our sun into interstellar space, the farthest traveled by a man-made object. This field of influence formed the basis for all future missions, allowing man to set his sights on getting into deep space economically. The Rosetta mission had different challenges, to catch up with and orbit a comet, 67P churyumov gerasimenko It had a large elliptical orbit around the Sun, stretching from the orbit of Jupiter to within the orbit of Mars. Launched in 2004, a year later the probe passed by Earth for the first gravity assist that flung it towards the orbit of Mars. Two years later, Rosetta grazed Mars, building up momentum, then swung by Earth for a second time, launching it deeper into space. The following year, Rosetta passed by asteroid Steins, before swinging back for a third gravity assist from Earth. And in 2010, Rosetta passed by asteroid Lutetia. Going into hibernation, Rosetta continued its parabolic trajectory towards its final destination. Four years later, Rosetta emerged from its cold sleep as it crossed paths with the comet, a circuitous flight indeed. The spacecraft then embarked on a series of maneuvers that took it on two successive triangular paths. Its trajectory was fine-tuned with thruster burns until it closed in to within about 30 kilometers of the comet, where the spacecraft entered actual orbit around it. Rosetta remained with the comet, delivering it cargo, then conducting science observations as it swung about the sun, then concluded with a gentle impact on the comet's surface in 2015. 
we're going to refine our ideas of, of what the comet is, where the comet came from, and encapsulate that within our ideas of, of how the solar system formed. And the complexity of the data set that we have also allows us to be more complex in our ideas and our theories. And that is the beauty of Rosetta, and we're starting to see that happening now, that we're really able to hone down our ideas of how the comet formed, how that fits in the evolution of the solar system, and that's going to continue. The Ulysses spacecraft had to leave the ecliptic plane of the solar system to study the polar regions of the Sun. Accordingly, it needed to change its orbital inclination. This required a large change in heliocentric velocity, so a gravity assist maneuver around Jupiter was chosen. The giant planet's gravity bent the spacecraft's flight path southward, putting it into an orbit over and under the Sun's north and south poles. The ion-powered Dawn spacecraft took maneuvering a step further. Dawn's the only spacecraft ever in more than 58 years of space exploration to orbit two extraterrestrial destinations, the last uncharted worlds in the inner solar system. And it not only allows us to get to these distant bodies, but once we're in orbit, we can maneuver extensively in order to get the best possible science that we can from them. NASA's latest mission is underway. OSIRIS-REx is the agency's first attempt at intercepting and touching down on an asteroid. No ordinary asteroid either. Bennu is its name. Orbiting the Sun very closely to Earth's orbit, it has been deemed a possible impact threat in the coming centuries. NASA intends to take a sample of the asteroid and return it to Earth for further study and possibly help form plans to redirect Bennu. To match the orbit, OSIRIS-REx made a very close swing by the Earth a year after launch. It passed by the South Pole to change its orbital inclination several degrees to match that of Bennu. Once matching orbits, OSIRIS-REx must perform a series of braking maneuvers to match velocity and enter an orbit around the asteroid. After mapping and studying the body, OSIRIS-REx will drop down to the surface and collect a sample of material. With some clever robotics, the sample return capsule will be delivered back to Earth. is so intriguing to me about asteroids is that they really are time capsules. They actually are samples of what the solar system was like billions of years ago. Asteroids are small bodies that never got made into something big like a planet. So anything that got made into a planet got melted down, got changed. There were lots of things that went on. Asteroids are pristine. Nothing really altered them for billions of years. So when you go out and you take a sample of an asteroid, you have in your hands a real sample of what the solar system was like billions of years ago. What were the conditions? What was the chemistry like? What can you learn about the formation of our own planet and ourselves by looking at what the solar system was like billions of years ago? And this sample is incredibly scientifically important. I think that people will be studying it for generations to come. The Juno space vehicle was launched in August 2011. In 2012, at perihelion, the craft performed some maneuvers out beyond Mars orbit and arched back towards Earth for a kick in speed and direction. In October 2013, it flew by Earth, a mere 500 kilometers from the surface. This slingshot sent it on a three-year journey directly towards an interception with Jupiter. Jupiter orbit insertion is probably one of the most important things in the entire mission, and it's because that changes us from being in orbit around the sun to being captured in orbit around Jupiter. And if you're not in orbit around Jupiter, you can't do the science we want to do. And 
what we're learning now is even in other solar systems, they don't always all have a monster like Jupiter. And many people think, boy, you almost need a Jupiter to have an Earth, maybe. Jupiter played a big, important role. But its environment, everything about it is extreme. It's, it's the, a planet on steroids, right? It is the most extreme in every way it can be. So it has the strongest magnetic field, the strongest gravity field. It has the most harsh radiation. It's spinning super fast. I mean, it's everything about it is this extreme environment. The Juno mission is unique because it's the first time that we've ever gone in a polar orbit, which goes from pole to pole, over the North Pole, through Periapsis, and uh, under the South Pole. Uh, all the other missions we've done and all the observations we made from Earth were made from the equator. And you don't see the poles very well if you're sitting on the equator. Yeah, so this is the first time we get the first clear, unobstructed view of what the aurora looks like and what the polar phenomena looks like. And at the same time, we're flying through the magnetosphere right above the aurora so we can sample in situ the charged particles that are precipitating down magnetic field lines, the guys that are exciting the emissions that we see. This is the first time we've ever been able to do that. The 6.7 year, 5 billion kilometer transit journey of the Cassini probe was slightly longer than the direct Hohmann transfer. The mass of the Cassini spacecraft was such that, even with the Titan IV launch vehicle, Cassini needed added help to reach Saturn. So, to gain momentum, the Cassini mission included several gravitational slingshot maneuvers. Two flyby passes of Venus, one of the Earth, and then one from the mighty planet Jupiter. The Cassini orbiter then spent several years orbiting and maneuvering around the planet and its moons, finally diving through the inner rings of the planet. Well, when we go into the proximal orbits between the rings and the planet, we've never been there before and we'll be a little bit more concerned. Here we've actually been closer to these rings, the Janus Epimetheus ring and the F ring, when we went into orbit around Saturn. So this is not un unexplored territory at this point. Uh, the, the nice thing about this, though, is that we've got a much better viewing angle of the rings because of the sun this time around. And eventually into its atmosphere. Horizons spacecraft had further to go than Cassini, but being far less massive a probe, it was able to be launched directly towards Jupiter. The spacecraft was launched in 2006 and made its way to Jupiter. Its closest approach happened only a year after its departure, at a distance of 2.3 million kilometers. The flyby provided a gravity assist that increased the probe's speed it also allowed for a general test of New Horizons scientific capabilities, returning data about the planet's atmosphere, moons and magnetosphere. Most of the post-Jupiter voyage was spent in hibernation mode to preserve onboard systems. In 2014, New Horizons was brought back online for the Pluto encounter. It flew 12,500 kilometers above the surface of Pluto, making it the first spacecraft to explore the dwarf planet, and then on into the Kuiper Belt towards its next target, a Kuiper Belt object most likely composed of frozen volatiles or ice, such as methane, ammonia, and water. A future probe to return to Jupiter's moons is destined for another multi-year journey. JUICE, to be launched in 2022, will embark upon a seven-year odyssey, taking the spacecraft via an Earth swing-by, then to Venus, 
back to Earth with a slingshot to Mars, then back to Earth for a final kick, direct to Jupiter. Heading outward bound is one thing, but launching payloads inward towards the Sun is another set of problems. For example, the BepiColombo mission to Mercury, launching this year, will require nine gravity assist maneuvers. After launch, a two-year journey using ion propulsion will bring it back to Earth for a kick towards Venus. Followed a year later by another flyby of Venus, sending it closer towards the orbit of Mercury. In the following four years, the spacecraft will pass by Mercury, tightening its heliocentric orbit until it can match Mercury's speed, and with the aid of chemical rocket motors, insert itself into that planet's orbit in 2025. So studying Mercury is crucial to better understand the formation of our solar system, how Earth is formed and evolved and where we are coming from. So Mercury is in a way a missing piece in the big puzzle of the formation of the solar system and a crucial end member because it's close to the Sun and if you want to get this full picture you have to look at the planet close to the Sun as we also did in future uh, past missions that we were looking at the comets or planets further out. Our aim, well, main target is the environment around the Mercury, especially the interaction between the solar wind and the Mercury magnetosphere. Mercury is three times closer to the Sun and therefore the radiation or the uh, heat which we are getting from Mercury is ten times higher. So everything which we had to develop had to withstand the higher temperatures, but also the higher radiation doses which we got from the solar wind. And for that we need special insulation of our spacecraft, special materials to be developed for the antenna, for the solar panels. And uh, yeah, that uh, was a very big challenge for the mission in itself. There are two more missions in the next year or two that will travel further inward than Mercury, ESA's Solar Orbiter and NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Planned for a 2018-19 launch, ESA's Solar Orbiter will take several gravity assists from Earth and Venus to enter an elliptical orbit resonant with Venus so that subsequent gravity assists will raise the orbital inclination, resulting in an operational orbit of 25 degrees inclined to the ecliptic plane and increasing to 34 degrees, making direct viewing of the Sun's polar regions possible. During the nominal seven-year mission, the main scientific activity will take place during the near-Sun encounter and high latitude parts of each orbit, with different science goals planned for each orbit. Together with NASA's Parker Solar Probe mission, it's hoped it will revolutionize our understanding of the Sun, where changing conditions can percolate out into the solar system, affecting Earth and other worlds. Launch window is late 2018. 
It will use Venus gravity assists during seven flybys over nearly seven years to gradually bring its orbit closer to the Sun. At closest approach, the Parker Solar Probe will travel around the Sun at approximately 700,000 kilometers an hour. Some 10 times closer than Mercury, the front of Parker Solar Probe's solar shield faces temperatures approaching 1,377 degrees Celsius. It will travel through the Sun's atmosphere, closer to the surface than any spacecraft before it, facing brutal heat and radiation conditions, and ultimately providing humanity with the closest ever observations of a star. Flying into the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere, known as the corona for the first time, Parker Solar Pro will employ a combination of in situ measurements and imaging to revolutionize our understanding of the corona expand our knowledge of the origin and evolution of the solar wind and explore what accelerates the solar wind as well as solar energetic particles. It will also make critical contributions to our ability to forecast changes in our space environment that affect life and technology on Earth.